I'd like to invite our keynote speaker up to the stage. If you don't know Peyton Robertson, he is an incredible young man. Um, he was recently named 30 under 30 for the Forbes science list. Forbes, guys, this is like big time, right? Um, he has six patents, I don't have one. Um, and if you'd like to know more about Peyton, please just take a look at one of these screens and you'll find out a little bit more about it. Finally tonight, the 11 year old inventor who stunned grown ups with a blazing idea. Next guest is an inventor who just was named America's top young scientist. Engineers say Peyton's invention is the real deal. We're all gonna benefit from you. Thank you so much. You guys are fantastic, and this is what America's all about. Thanks, guys. Imagine the sixth grader showed the president retractable training wheels. Said he made it for seven-year-old twin sisters. So when a child feels confident, he or she can actually squeeze a handbrake. Those training wheels will retract. If you feel like going back and fall, yeah. you can do that. Right away. Right back down. And in any position, it locks into place. So even if you feel like you feel bad, it will still be doing at times. You can sit back and study the position. I can still use this now. So, uh, <laughs> where do I find spots? Huh? Let's, let's just invest in this guy. And then we'll see, like, 20 years from now, we'll be rich. First, this is right around the corner, so we brought back one of the smartest kids we know to test this year's hottest toys from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Please welcome 12 year old inventor Peyton Robertson. Okay, this kid. Yeah, true. Bow down and have no hand. All right, uh, thank you so much. So, um, speaking of Nobel Prizes, uh, there was once a Nobel Prize winning physicist um, who was on a speaking tour, right? And unlike um, most Nobel Prize winning physicists, perhaps, uh, this physicist was afraid of flying. And that might not be expected, but he had a driver. And this driver drove him to every location because he couldn't fly. And at this point, the driver had heard the speech so many times that the driver was pretty certain that he could give the speech for him. He said, you know, I've done it so many times, I bet you I can do it in your place. And so they do it. And um, the driver comes and he dresses up as the physicist in his lab coat. Um, and the physicist goes and sits in the back in the driver's uniform. Um, and it goes great. The driver uh, executes the speech absolutely perfectly. Um, and then there's a question from someone in the front. And uh, they have a quite long question that requires calculus and five minutes of explanation. And um, you know, the driver's just sitting there, a little confused. Um, and then, without batting an eye, he turns to the physicist in the back and says, that question was so easy, I'll let my driver answer it for you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of how I feel today, because um, I feel like an imposter up here, because you guys' accomplishments are just so incredible and um, so admirable in your entrepreneurship. So hopefully I'll still be able to uh, spark some ideas that are related to your entrepreneurship and that can be applicable um, to your small businesses. Um, and I'm going to do this in the form of bridges, because Fort Lauderdale has 226 of them. Um, that's pretty impressive. Uh, we're like the Venice of the U.S., a lot of people would say. Um, and, and all of them help to overcome a specific obstacle, right? Um, and namely, uh, Fort Lauderdale's waterways, right? Um, so I'm going to talk about two different metaphorical bridges. Um, that I hope will be applicable to um, your small businesses and entrepreneurship. And the first of those is innovation as a bridge. So innovation is going to be a bridge that connects problems and opportunities. And then we're also going to talk about resilience as a bridge, uh, which connects failure and progress. But um, going for the first one, innovation as a bridge. Um, how do we understand that? So um, Louis Braille, right, uh, a name you probably might be familiar with, at least the last name, 
Um, when he was three years old, um, he was playing around in his father's workshop and he stumbled across uh, a quite dangerous tool called an awl. Um, and one time he was playing with the awl and trying to poke holes in leather as one does with an awl. Um, and one time it slipped, right? And it poked his eye. And then it got infected and it spread to the other eye. And by the time Louis was five years old, he was totally blind. Um, so clearly that's, that's a problem, right? Um, he couldn't read, um, but as many people who with blindness do, he was able to overcome it. Um, and he learned about uh, something called night writing, which is a military communication system which spies use to, to send messages in the dark. And he thought about this and he tried to make it more universally applicable. So he developed the Braille alphabet. Um, and he used the very instrument that blinded him to do so. He used it all. And he poked little holes in a piece of paper. And then as you rubbed your finger across it, uh, you could read the letters just by looking at the pattern and the dots. And that's exactly what the Braille alphabet is. And now the alphabet is so universal that you can see it in schools. It's been translated from its original French into English and even into music notation. So it's totally universal. <laughs> and he was able to, able to create this opportunity for many people to come to be able to read by looking at his problem and using innovation to make it an opportunity. So that's Louis Braille. Um, similarly, uh, Joseph Lister, um, he was a surgeon in the 19th century, um, back when surgeons didn't wash their instruments. And that's because the theory of medicine was based off of a humoral theory of the body. And that was about how the body would restore itself to health if it had enough time. All doctors gave was just care to help the body restore its own balance to the worst. Um, but then Pasteur came along. And Pasteur um, said that it's about microbes. It's about these tiny little microorganisms that are actually alive, but you can't see them. Um, so no one really believed in because how, well, how can you ask someone to, to uh, believe something they can't see? And um, Joseph Lister did. And, but no one would let him use his technique because it wasn't tested, um, it wasn't a consensus in the medical community. But he developed this machine anyway. He innovated regardless. And he developed this machine um, that allowed you to spray carbolic acid, which is an antiseptic, onto wounds. Um, and it disinfected it. And then eventually his sister needed surgery. And no one would do it because it was an open wound and it would easily get infected by standard techniques. So then what Joseph Lister did is he did it himself using the machine. And it worked. It was a huge success. And then eventually, Queen Victoria in England needed surgery. And she called Joseph Lister. Perhaps not called him, but and she asked Joseph Lister. <laughs> and, um, um, so, this was his claim to fame, right? He had done surgery on the Queen. And he went lecturing in America, and he met a Mr. Johnson at one of the conferences. And this Mr. Johnson had a brother also named Mr. Johnson. And um, they together started Johnson & Johnson, um, which is a brand you might know mostly because of their product, Listerine, which is named after Joseph Lister. So when you see Listerine, think about Joseph Lister and how he developed this antiseptic that um, saved, I mean, a countless number of lives for years to come just by turning um, an initial problem in the form of his sister's surgery and the fact that nobody would believe him um, into an eventual opportunity to help people. So um, I have a personal experience with um, uh, problems and opportunities and uh, changing it in the form of innovation. And that comes with retractable training wheels. Um, which were a, um, an attachment to a bicycle that I developed because my sisters were learning how to ride a bike uh, when they were about four years old. Um, and uh, when they were learning, they had to make a compromise. They had to decide whether they wanted to uh, balance their body weight on two wheels or whether they wanted to choose safety because if you use training wheels, right, then you don't get that feeling of balancing your weight. And if you don't use training wheels, um, then you risk falling and getting hurt. So um, what I wanted to, to give them was the best of both universes. They could achieve both at the same time. And so I developed their retractable training wheels, which is what you do is you take the handlebar and you turn it and you lift it and it becomes just like a normal bike. This, these wheels are off the ground. So you get that feeling of balancing. 
And then if you feel like you're about to fall, you push the button and it comes back to the ground and you can't hurt yourself. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so eventually this was, uh, it was tested, it was refined, um, it was patented, and um, now I'm in the process of negotiating the license for it. Um, so that's the next step in turning um, uh, the initial problem, which I saw uh, with my sisters learning how to ride, into an ultimate opportunity. Um, so, um, apologize for the clicker, but I will keep going anyway. Um, so our next metaphorical bridge is going to be uh, resilience. And resilience, as I said, is a bridge that connects failure and progress. So um, as Mr. Johansson said at the beginning, failure is going to be um, super important, not because failing in itself is good, but failing allows you to make pivots. It allows you to, when something's not going quite as it should, to pivot and try something new. Resilience is a muscle. It's something that you build. As uh, psychologist Adam Grant said, um, resilience isn't something that you're, say, born with like a fixed amount of. It's something you have to exercise. And the only way you really um, exercise the muscle of resilience, like any other muscle, is breaking it down and then building it back stronger. And the way you do that is by failing. Failing and then having the resilience to try again. And then fail once again. And then you build resilience and it keeps going. So resilience is what allows you to pivot when needed. And you see that in terms of Silicon Valley companies all the time. So for example, um, Cake Odeo. It was a subscription service for podcasts. Um, and you probably haven't heard of it because iTunes took over its niche. So they had to think about how they're going to change, how they're going to redevelop, as many businesses have to do. Um, and uh, what, they came up, what they came up with was a microblogging platform. And this was a huge success. And we now know it as Twitter. <laughs> so it's hugely successful. Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> Anyways, um, so. <laughs> Uh, so another example of this would be The Point. It was, a, uh, it was a socially good fundraising site, and it had this tipping point system where once enough people donated, it eventually allowed all of the money to be given to some organization, and this encouraged people to donate, right? So um, what was done uh, was the founder of The Point had this idea where he was going to make this into local deals. So people on a local level could trade, and uh, once enough people agreed to pay, it would, unlock, it would unlock a coupon or a discount. And now this is um, an amazingly popular app, and we know it as Groupon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and yet, yet another example uh, will be Bourbon. Um, Bourbon, it was a check-in app. It had uh, elements of gaming and photos and lots of Clutter. So the developers had to say, how are we going to declutter this? How are we going to make it, um, make it better? And what they ended up doing um, was just going to photos, just focusing on the photo elements. And now it has 800 million active users, and we know it is Instagram. Oh. Yeah, so that's a huge change right there. And I have a personal experience uh, with resilience and failure and progress as well. Um, and that's in the form of the dropstick. It was, a, it was a golf device that I developed in response to a proposed USGA rules change. And um, in golf, right, the USGA is the governing body. And uh, there's a ton of rules in golf. And one of them is if you hit your ball, say, in like a water hazard or on a sprinkler head, you have to take relief, or, or you don't have to, but you really should. Um, using a golf club, right? And you measure the distance using your club and you say one or two club lengths away from the point. Um, but they said this isn't totally fair because like what if your clubs are longer or if you're really tall? That's not really fair. It's not the same for everyone. Um, so they said we're going to use a standard metric. It's going to be 20 inches or 80 inches depending on the situation. Um, so I developed the drop set um, which allows you to measure that precise distance. It's 40 inches long, so 80 inches can be measured easily. Um, and a 20 inch distance can be measured by expanding it and then putting the two ends together. And now every point of this arc is 20 inches away from the center. So it's easy to put it down and then drop your ball easily. Right? Um, so uh, I thought this would be really great for people because it looks just like an alignment stick, which is something that a lot of players already have in their bag. Um, eventually, I presented it at the PGA Super Show up in Orlando. I took over a thousand pre-orders, um, and uh, 
the USGA gave me an equipment stamp of approval. And then after all of this happened, the USGA reversed the rule. <laughs> and they said, nope, back to club links. And that's kind of just how it is. I don't have any control over that, um, unfortunately. Maybe one of you guys do. <laughs> um, but uh, what, now I'm in the process of pivoting, right? Of uh, taking that initial um, failure and trying to make at least something useful out of it, um, whether that's continuing and finding another use or just using what I learned and the connections that I made. Um, so that, those are our two bridges, right? Um, innovation um, as a bridge connecting problems and opportunities. Um, remember Louis Braille um, and how he developed the alphabet in response to a problem. Remember Listerine um, and make it, uh, let it make you think of uh, how uh, Joseph Lister turned problems into opportunities, the problem of assistive surgery. And then failure is progress. Um, that's super important. I remember the Silicon Valley companies who totally changed their name and their image uh, just by having a slight pivot. Um, so thank you guys so much. Hopefully this will be all relevant uh, to uh, entrepreneurship and your small businesses. Uh, congratulations on all of your achievements. Thank you so much.